The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rebecca with WFIA, and I'm sure you all have my opening spiel memorized, but we leave everyone in listen-only mode while our, our presenter goes over everything. But at some point when we get to questions, I'm going to unmute everyone. So please make sure that you're muted on your end so that we don't get background noise. And as always, you can type in a question on the questions panel or do the little hand raise button if you have a question and you want me to get to you. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jan. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jan G. I'm your president and CEO, and welcome once again to our Tuesday COVID webinars. And uh, last week we talked, and you asked for a, a kind of a UI 101 uh, quick course so that you could understand the structure of UI and what's going to happen in the future to tax increases and that type of thing. So we have the perfect person to give a presentation. And when he is done, um, he, he has another appointment and he'll sign off. And I'm gonna go through some tax charts with you to help you figure out where you are. So uh, you'll understand those better by listening to Scott Michael, who is the Legal Services Coordination Manager for our State Employment Security. Uh, he earned his JD Magnum Cum Laude at Hamlin University School of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Since his admission to the bar, he, Scott has spent his whole legal career as a public servant in the state of Washington. He joined Employment Security in 2011 where he was tasked with managing unemployment insurance uh, tax appeals by leading a small group, a, a small team representing the department. Uh, he, his job was expanded in 2018 to include agency rulemaking regarding unemployment insurance, as well as providing technical assistance to the legislature on bills impacting state unemployment insurance. So I'm sure that uh, Kat Holm on our staff and, and Tammy Hetrick will be interfacing with Scott a great deal this coming session. And Scott, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, it's all yours. Okay, wonderful. And is my uh, PowerPoint uh, visible to the group? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I was asked here to try to give a, a in less than half an hour with including some Q&A, uh, a rundown of uh, unemployment taxes and tax rates. And uh, I also want to include some of the stuff that the agency and the legislature and the governor and the federal government has done uh, to try to lessen the tax burden uh, on employers coming up in 2021 which seems so close yet so far away at the same time. So here goes. All right, there we go. So this, for, for purposes of tax rates, this is the mathematical formula that makes the entire unemployment insurance tax rate system uh, go round. This is the uh, simple division that keeps, uh, that drives the whole process. And that is your tax rate, meaning the percentage of wages that you have to pay taxes on, uh, is your the benefit charges. So meaning the amount of benefits that we pay to your employees that we then charge to your account, divided by your taxable wages, meaning the uh, wages that you have to pay tax on up to the taxable wage base, uh, which in, in Washington, I believe is in the upper 50s at this point. Um, upper 50,000s. Uh, so benefit charges divided by taxable wages equals your tax rate. Uh, on, a, on a macro level, this is how that works. Um, the analogy I really like to use in talking about this is eyeball pizza. For those of you who remember fractions uh, when you were doing like third, fourth, or fifth grade, whenever you learned fractions in, in your elementary school, 
uh, they always they always like to use the pizza analogy. How much of a piece of pizza do you want to eat? And you know, it's always the you always talk about the yummy pizzas, and so you always want a big fraction of that. And so you want to have your numerator being big and your denominator being as close to your numerator as possible. So that means you, if you have three-fourths of a pizza pizza, that's a lot of yummy pizza you get to eat as a fourth grader. Well, this is not yummy pizza. This is eyeball pizza. This is gross pizza you as an employer do not want to eat. And so as a general rule, you want to keep your the amount of benefit charges that uh, or the amount of benefits that we pay to your employees as small as possible, especially in relation to your taxable wages. So for this eyeball pizza, which is your tax rate, you want to eat about one one hundredth of this eyeball pizza, if at all possible. And if at all possible, which I know during these times is tough, if you can get your benefit charges to zero, I mean, then you get no pizza and then your tax rate is as small as we can make it. So the next uh, uh, things I want to talk about now is the four parts of your tax rate that we use to calculate your tax rate every year. And so the first part is your experience rate. And so this is the amount of tax that we charge to you based on that formula I just talked about. Uh, benefit charges divided by taxable wages. This is, what, this is what drives it down and this has the largest variety. If you have no benefit charges, the experience rate of your tax is gonna be zero. If you have a lot of benefit charges, it can go up to the, state, uh, to the uh, max at 5.40%. Uh, the second part is a social cost. This is an extra cost that we uh, that is added on by the legislature that we uh, add on, uh, which basically helps cover costs that uh, of running the insurance system, any insurance program that you run, and we are an insurance company at the end of the day, is always going to have costs that you can't uh, recuperate by charging higher insurance premiums to someone else. Uh, you may have to pay out on a policy that you can't get your money back from. There may be errors in the policies that you pay out on. And sometimes you, uh, you know, we, we pay out on policies uh, with the expectation that we won't get our money back. For example, we pay benefits to victims of domestic violence uh, who need to leave their employment in order to enter domestic, uh, you know, go, uh, take uh, escape domestic violence. We don't charge employers for that, but we stay pay out benefits. So that's part of what social cost covers. So during the best days of the economy over the past 10 years, the social cost has been as low as 0.10%. During the worst years of the economy, the most that we can charge any one employer uh, for the social cost is 1.46%. That is the absolute top maximum. And that's what we will probably hit uh, during uh, during the next year. But remember, the social cost also has kind of sort of experience rated. If your experience rate is low, your portion of the social cost is also going to be relatively lower. Also, if your experience rate is high, your portion of the social cost is going to be uh, higher. And what really goes into basically calculating the base level of social cost, which you, you as an employer can go up and down from, is basically a function of how much money we're paying out in benefits versus how much money is coming in in, to, in taxes, and then a function of how much money is left in the trust fund. Third part of the uh, tax rate is a really two one hundredths or three one hundredths of a percent. Uh, this doesn't actually go into the trust fund. Uh, this goes into a different pot of money, which uh, basically helps us uh, run programs within the agency to help out the unemployed. Uh, again, very small part of anyone's tax rate. And then the fourth part of your tax rate is a solvency surcharge. Even during the Great Recession, we haven't had to charge one. Looks like coming up this after coming next year, we may have to charge as much as 0.20%. And this gets triggered on when there's seven months of benefits left in the trust fund. So if you have enough money in the trust fund to pay seven months of benefits or less, then we have the opportunity to turn on the solvency surcharge. So this will turn on next year at the earliest, and it can go up to 0.20%. Now it looks like we may need to do that. 
How, and then uh, another uh, maximum that may be in there is that ex that uh, will probably uh, also hit. Is we may hit the cap for what somebody's experience rate plus their social cost may be. And so that's going to be 6% or less. So it's not going to be 5.40 plus 1.46. So it's, you're not going to get up to 6.86%. It's going to be 6% uh, tops for what is your experience rate plus your social cost. So if we look at today, uh, tax rates for 2020, the lowest tax rate we charge is 0.13%. And so this includes all the components of the tax rate. Uh, the average for most employers is 0.99%, and then the highest tax rate is 5.72. So assuming somebody has $1.3 million in payroll, uh, that can range from $1,690 per year up to $74,360 per year in tax. In 2021, uh, given uh, the current projections, how much money that we have paid out in benefits and how much money that uh, is left in the trust fund, uh, this is what we're looking at based on the statutory formulas, is that the lowest tax rate we will charge somebody is 0.72%, and then the highest tax rate is 6.23%. And so assuming a $1.3 million payroll, uh, it can range anywhere from $9,360 up to $80,990. Now, some of you may have been wondering, what about all that unemployment fraud that happened? all those Nigerians that ran away with hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, how is this gonna impact me as an employer and my tax rates? And the answer is, it pro it's probably not gonna happen, impact your tax rates at all. The amount of money that was stolen and then the amount of money that we've recovered is really a drop in the bucket compared to the billions of dollars that we have paid out. So we are still going to hit the statutory maximums even if all none of that unemployment fraud had happened, this would still be your ta projected tax rates into the next year. So it's bad it happened. We're working to, we're working to get the money back. We've recovered more than half of it already, and uh, we're doing everything we can to get that, more of that money back. But ultimately, as an employer, the impact on you and your tax rates is going to be none. So some things that we are doing uh, and have done over the course of this year to give employers more relief of benefit charges. Now, when I say relief of benefit charges, uh, this is a, a legal term of art that we use within the agency and within the unemployment world. And it basically means that whenever we pay benefits to a claimant, but then we don't uh, charge those benefits to one of those, uh, one of those uh, uh, claimant's employers, we say that that employer received relief of benefit charges, meaning that the benefits we pay out don't go into that eyeball pizza formula I talked about a few slides back. It doesn't count against you. You're not going to get, uh, get a bigger slice of, of tax rates than eyeball pizza. So some things that we will automatically not charge to your account this year. One is the waiting week. Uh, during normal times, uh, uh, Bene uh, claimants have to wait an unpaid week, so they don't get any benefits for their first week that they're unemployed, and so we call that the waiting week. Well, uh, thanks to the federal government, uh, they have given us money to pay benefits during that waiting week, and so that is federally funded, so we're not going to charge that to you, our state employers. Same with shared work benefits. For those of you who don't know what shared work is, I highly encourage you to explore this. Uh, shared work is basically where instead of completely laying off your staff, you've reduced their hours by 10 to 50%. And then unemployment comes in and helps them out with the wages that they lost and with about 10 to 50% of the unemployment benefits they would normally get. So you people, uh, so claimants who are on shared work end up with more money in their pocket on a week by week basis than claimants who are completely and totally laid off. And so it's better for your claimants. And also, uh, thanks again to the federal government and the CARES Act, it's also better for you, the employer, because those shared work benefits don't get charged to you at all. So we highly, highly encourage folks to uh, explore shared work and get on our website, esd.wa.gov and, and explore shared work. Uh, extended benefits. 
Uh, so this is a, a, a program that kicks in during periods of high employment. It's been around since the 80s. Uh, we only use it, again, when there's high unemployment, like during the Great Recession and now. Uh, but those are not charged to you at all. And then any of the benefits from the Federal CARES Act program, so the pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, the extra $600 that have been added on to everybody's uh, benefit checks, none of that is charged to you. That's all courtesy of the federal government. Uh, other things that changed this year to also give you relief of benefit charges if you write in the letter and you ask us. And so when we send you a notice saying, hey, uh, uh, John Smith has filed a claim. Uh, would you do you, uh, do you do you contest this? Do you want relief of charges? Uh, here are some new things this year uh, that have uh, come about uh, as a result that will give you more relief of charges. One is if you had to shut down or curtail your operations because uh, somebody came into your workspace with COVID-19, and so you had to do like an office-wide quarantine. Uh, that is, uh, you're now eligible for relief of benefit charges on that basis. Uh, if you had to uh, lay off an employee, an employee had to stop working uh, because they were uh, told by a health official to go into isolation or quarantine. So this isn't a stay home order. This is their doctor told them you need to go into isolation or quarantine. Uh, then uh, you're eligible for relief of benefit charges for that time they're in isolation or quarantine. A uh, new bill that passed this year uh, that was we proposed back in January, back before this was a whole mess, which uh, the legislature passed, was if an individual could not meet job prerequisites as required by law. For example, uh, if they have to uh, go through a regular background check and then they fail the background check. Well, you can't hire them because they're not meeting background check requirements. You can't keep them employed. They have to lay them off. Uh, therefore, if they're not being able to meet those prerequisites that are required by law, that is possibly eligible for relief of benefit charges. Uh, a new one that came, uh, that's actually been on the books for a couple of years, but uh, suddenly became effective now that we started paid, paid family medical leave benefits, is if you do have an employee who goes on paid family medical leave and you need to backfill that position, and then the employee who went on leave comes back, and then the replacement uh, who you had backfilling their position now has to be laid off. That replacement's benefits uh, are, can be, uh, you won't, we, we can not charge you for that. So you have to send us a letter, let us know that that's what happened and we can give you relief of benefit charges so that when that replacement employee is laid off, those benefits are not gonna be charged to you. And then another bill that passed at the uh, with the legislature this year at the tail end of legislature is that the uh, uh, legislature says a $25 million fund to give employers uh, a, a, a share, uh, some relief of charges if they had to close or curtail their operations due to COVID-19. Uh, the proposed rules that the agency has uh, just proposed last week uh, say that uh, what that means is that if you had to close for, due to an order from the governor, state or local health officials, you couldn't have more than 50 people. Uh, yeah, uh, you were a non-essential business that had to have all your staff stay home and stay healthy. Uh, you're not in the right phase of the county's reopening process to allow your business to start back up again. Uh, all of these things uh, are basically those benefits that were paid out while your business was closed or had its operations curtailed are eligible for applying for that fund. So long as you have brought that employee back for at least four weeks, and then you also brought them back with at least 90% of their pay. So if you paid them a hundred bucks uh, a week uh, last uh, when you laid them off, and as long as you're paying them, uh, 90 bucks a week uh, when you bring them back, then that meets that 90% threshold. So, and that's for a share of benefits. So basically what will happen is that uh, folks have to apply by September 30th. We're currently writing the applications right now. I had some emails about that this morning. Um, and we're trying to make them as user-friendly for you as possible. Uh, you basically submit the application by September 30th. 
uh, we will give you, and then we'll take all of the employers who are approved for that program, and we'll just basically take that $25 million and divide it amongst the pool of eligible employers. So if there's, uh, so it could range from all these benefits are completely forgiven to maybe 10% of these benefits will be forgiven, maybe 1%. It just depends on how many people apply. So knowing what we know now, that $25 million is gonna be spread pretty thin, but again, it all depends on people who apply. If you don't apply, you don't get anything. So uh, that's how that works. And then the last thing I wanna leave this in is a gigantic caveat. Is all of this that I just talked about as far as uh, tax rate projections, relief of benefit charges, all of that is up in the air between now and next year. First 2021 unemployment taxes are due April 30th, 2021. Congress could pass a new COVID-19 bill. It's already passed a couple. Uh, they've, they're always talking about the next CARES Act. Uh, there's been the HEROES Act that has passed the House. There's all sorts of bills that Congress could eventually pass between now and April 30th, 2021. Um, that will ha have an impact on your, could have an impact on your 2021 taxes. Uh, state legislative session, the regular session starts in January. There could also be a special session between now and January. So during those times, there could be more state action to grant, uh, to change the whole uh, benefit charges and tax rates. So I tell you this with what I know now, based on the law as it exists now, but the law around this has changed, our world has changed so much in the past five months. And I think it would be foolhardy to say that it's gonna stay, that we expect it to stay the same over the next five months. So stay tuned, but this is what we know as of today. And with that, I will open myself up for some questions. Super. Hey, thanks a lot, Scott. Um, do we have any questions in the box, Rebecca? I'm working on getting everyone unmuted right now. So as Rebecca's working on unmuting you all, would you please make sure you self mute? Uh, unless you have a question to ask here. Now is the time to ask one question. I'm, I'm going to, uh, or a statement and a question here, Scott. Um, so you talked about a lot of the non-charging that is going on because of COVID, but that non-charging is all going to be piled onto the socialized tax that all employers pay, correct? So yes, uh, the benefits are that we pay out, all benefits we pay out, whether it's uh, charged or not, do factor into the social tax. And so it's not completely free, Basically, we, we like to think of, we use the term within the agency called socialized. Basically, where instead of these charges being the responsible of one employer, it becomes diversified across the entire employer pool. So, for example, uh, you know, letting, letting employees leave their job so that they can escape domestic violence and collect unemployment benefits while they're escaping domestic violence. This is a public good, I believe, that everybody, that almost everybody can get behind. But we don't want that responsibility to be on the one employer who happened to be hiring somebody who is in a domestic violence situation. Instead, this is a public good that we share across the entire employer pool. So these COVID-19 relief of benefit charges, that's the same. Uh, the one thing, uh, the few things that will not be charged to you and also will not be socialized are those benefits that are currently being funded by the federal government. 
So that includes all of those CARES Act programs, including the extra $600, uh, the shared work benefits, and the waiting week benefits. All of those are completely and totally funded by the federal government and won't factor into the social cost. Yeah, and to our knowledge, at least at this point, the Congress is not charging that against our federal UI tax. They're, they're taking out a, out a general fund, so you pay on your general taxes. <laughs> so uh, let's see, it looks like Ellie's got her hands up, hand up, Rebecca. Yep. Did she talk? She should be able to, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure yes. can, Ellie. Okay. Um, my question is, you were re listing off the reasons that you could apply by September 30th. What if the what about the border closure affecting businesses, um, both in uh, border towns and then in Point Roberts, where we just lost 80% of our customers due to the border being closed? Would that be, would that qualify? No, that is a good question. I'm not sure if that's something that we have taken into account. And you're talking about the uh, closure with the Canadian border, is that right? Yeah, especially for me in Point Roberts, closing the border means, I, I mean, I lost literally 80% of my customers. Um, so I was able to stay open, but only for 20% of my customers. So I wasn't officially closed down, but um, business was drastically, drastically cut due to the the federal government closing that that national border so you know that is a very good question i will uh i, I am writing down that uh, piece of information right now and i'm going to take that back uh to the uh to the policy unit um and see what we can do uh with regards to that particular scenario and whether that would fit within the scenario of the 25 million dollars okay that's Thank great, you. Scott. Thanks. That's great. So uh, we, we do have a question in the question box now. Okay. If, if an employee chose to not work because of household family members being at risk, are they eligible for unemployment? And is the employer able to claim relief of benefits? Um, so under emergency rules that we passed uh, during the pandemic, uh, we said that uh, individuals who had high risk individuals at home and uh, were not working because they did not want to expose uh, their high, high risk household members or family members uh, that they were caring for uh, would be laid off due to a lack of work. Uh, what that also means, unfortunately, is that uh, they, uh, this is uh, would be charged uh, to employers uh, based on that. So, uh, uh, so yeah, that that would that is a scenario where uh, employers could be charged. Okay. Uh, a way to avoid that is uh, seeing what you can do as a uh, as an employer to see what can be done to offer them telework options. I don't know if that's an option for you, uh, for the uh, for the person asking this, but uh, if you can, uh, anybody who can telework is not eligible for any benefits uh, due to due to COVID nineteen issues. So that uh, it is some, that is a flexibility that you may want to investigate. Being the grocery and convenience store industry, we don't have many employees that can telework you pretty much have to be on the front lines to service the customers. So it's pretty rough. So uh, any other questions here? Uh, I promised Scott would let him out of here by three for his other appointment, but let's see, do we have any other questions? Rebecca, do you see anything? I don't see anything. Nope. Okay. Hey, Scott, thank you very, very much. And um, I'd appreciate it if you could get back to me uh, on the uh, on Ellie Hayton's issue uh, with her store being up there in a unique area of the state. Um, we have one more, sorry. Where do we get okay. the application for relief? 
so we have not finished writing it yet. Uh, we will have that posted on our website and uh, when it's ready. And we will also uh, have it ready for as a paper application, uh, which you can get from our accounts management center. And the phone number for that is 855 tax wage. Again, that's 855 T A X W A G E. That's the phone number. I don't know what those letters translate to. I don't have the <laughs> phone pad in front of me, but uh, so yeah, but we're still writing it and uh, we're doing what we can to make sure that uh, it is as user friendly as possible. For example, we are not making you submit any sort of additional documentation uh, or proofs or, or anything like that, to, or you know, payroll records to go along with your application. So, and as always, employment security has a stakeholder group that they uh, send out all of their proposed rules and final rules in our office. Several of us are on that list, so we'll get it and we will post it on our qualified website for for you under new this week when we get it. What's it look like, Scott? Another week or two? Uh, so the rules have been proposed and so that uh, that has gone out. Uh, so and Jan, I can uh, certainly uh, I'll forward you the link to that. Uh, and then there is a, a hearing uh, in, uh, I think, the second half of August, uh, where we will hear from the public about what the rules should be uh, with, and see what any sort of uh, last minute tweaks can be made. Uh, with the understanding, though, that, uh, you know, we also want to get these rules finalized uh, because applications are due at the end of September and uh, the earliest that we can adopt these rules officially is at the end of August. So we want to make sure that we make this as seamless as possible for folks. So we're way out. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay, Scott, thank you very, very much for making yourself available to us on short notice. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, next, um, I, I uh, uh, am going to share with our industry, um, Employment Security sent us charts of uh, for our grocery stores, our convenience stores and convenience stores with gas, as well as our warehouses. Our, uh, the warehouses is a, a little, it's always interesting to try to figure out which NICS code y'all fit in because you it depends on the kind of warehousing but we um we gathered those charts together as to where you are today and now that you've heard scott talk you'll be able to understand this uh, much better so the the thing that uh scott didn't uh touch on is that your the rate classes run one through 40. So if you're in one, it's great. You're not being charged any experience rating. You're just uh, being charged the social tax, which is at its very lowest rate right now because we have had a great economy in recent years. Um, so then as we look across here, it talks about number of employees that are in rate class one, uh, number of employer, excuse me. And so you can see how, it, because you're three year experience rated. So um, this one here is for the supermarkets. So you can see, and if you can just scroll down Rebecca slowly, how this number declines here where almost all of you are in the very lowest rate classes. So um, the example here, so you can see, I mean, look at this is the vast majority of you are within the first one, two, three, four, five, five, six uh, rate classes there. This is where that social tax is going to kick in and kill you. <laughs> Now, it will move to the chart because the charts are the, almost the same for all of our industry. It's pretty amazing how stable our industry is. 
So here are our uh, grocery warehouses, and you can see that the vast majority of them are at the lowest rate too. So you're gonna get hit pretty hard with this next rate increase, uh, even though you're scrambling and looking for people and having to hire temp services to fill all your uh, employment. And then let's just jump over to the convenience stores and the convenience stores with gas, you'll see same thing. You're all in those low tax rates there. These are with the gasoline, uh, gasoline convenience stores. So the reason we show this to you is to show you that your UI taxes now, the vast majority of you are at the very minimum tax. Um, how do you know where your tax rate is, uh, where you're at right now? What I did was to pull uh, the food industry's tax notice up. So somewhere in your payroll department, your whoever handles all of all of your record keeping, you get your employment security notices anywhere. Well, this year they're telling us it's really gonna be late, probably not till the mid to end of December. So you won't know how hard you got hit while you're doing your budgets this fall. But this is WFIA's uh, tax notice. And the way you pull that and then get right down here where it's highlighted, it tells you which rate class you're assigned to. So you can see WFIA is at the lowest rate class. And that's how you're going to be able to look at that. And this is going to be really important for you to know and to have at your fingertips because we know that there's going to be a gigantic tax increase. We know that, and, and you know, I kind of want to take you back in um, the early uh, 2000s. Uh, yeah, actually, it was the late uh, 90s. Uh, WFIA was one of the lead organizations that was up in arms over the high UI taxes and yet you're a stable industry. And the legislature rewrote the tax laws. Well, it was really rewritten by a coalition of business and labor. It was a bloody fight for a long time over the seasonal employers and those employers who had pretty consistent employment. And this whole UI system got rewritten we're one of the few states that had, did not have to borrow from the federal government during the big recession, which is a great thing for you. Because if you get too far in a deficit, you lose your credit on your federal taxes. So our system under normal circumstances is very good for our industry and it's very fair for industries across the board because you pay a lot less of the social tax. It's experience rated, as he said. Those of you down in rate class one, you're only paying a 40% calculation. Those of you up at rate class 40, where many of our, our uh, heavy industry and farmers are, they pay up to, I believe it's a 120% cap. So the system as it is today is very, very fair, but there are a lot of employers that are hurting now and a lot of business associations that are gonna be scrambling because these taxes are, we're gonna not have enough money to uh, continue on the benefits. Um, and as we told you last week, the business community, and that's through our business associations, have formed a coalition and rather have a bloodbath like we did in the late 90s over trying to get our system balanced and more fair. They are trying to come to an early agreement themselves and be able to take an agreement 
to the legislature for a short-term fix uh, and any long-term tweaks at anybody that they believe needs to happen. So as uh, Tammy and Kat and Carolyn, our contract lobbyists, are going to be working through that, they're going to be coming back to you with proposals. And you're going to be able to tell by what they're bringing back to you uh, and by having this background information you received today and pulling your own tax notice, you're going to be able to look at that and say, oh, my UI taxes under this proposal will increase 240% or under this one will increase 90% or et cetera, et cetera. And that is going to give uh, Kat and Carolyn, the guidance in working with the legislature in representing your voice. So it, it is a complicated system. It is a very fair system the way it is today. And we, we do not want to damage this system, but we want to make sure that we get out of this immediate crisis of totally draining the fund where we, we had so much money in that fund. Um, it's just been incredible. So uh, it went away very, very fast. So if there are, uh, are there any questions, Rebecca, before I turn this over to Tammy to talk about our new mask? <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing in the question box and I don't see any hands. So unless someone has something they want to bring up and they should be unmuted. So. Okay. So let's, uh, let's just make sure that uh, sometime over the next two, three weeks or so that you get your tax notice uh, from this year and take a look at it. So you can give us great input. And now, I am going to turn this over to Tammy Hetrick, our Vice President, uh, to give you another weekly update on masks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. You know, I feel like I'm just the bearer of gray news constantly on masks. And again, we have new guidance that I've posted on the website for you. And of course, like usual, I don't have all the answers or clarity. So what we have today is Ellen and I has worked with the governor's office and the Department of Health, and we have new guidance on the mask. So now employees, they have to wear a face covering, a mask, or if they can't wear a mask, they have to have a face shield with cloth covering the sides and the bottom. And um, we've seen some pretty creative ideas. And so um, we actually had a member find a pretty good concept. And so I will post that later for all of you. Uh, but the bottom line is, is what we expected from our calls last week is if that worker cannot wear a face mask or shield and you can't reasonably accommodate them with um, a job that's away from other people, then they will not be able to continue working. Um, this is a concern. I'm still waiting for the question and answer clarity and guidance. Um, I've been working with some of the members on, you know, what to do. Uh, and, and it is a challenge, you know, we're treating these as uh, medical leaves in most situations, but, um, you know, we're even getting odd notes from the doctor that isn't saying that they can't wear a mask, you know, due to a medical condition, but just that, that they would prefer not to. Well, that's not a valid reason. So there's just so much going on out there. You know, we really need more clarity. Uh, but right now, what we are receiving is this, and I've been told that I will have more guidance on how we're supposed to handle this uh, in the next few days. Uh, but I think my goal will be to have a legal um, guidance on the call for next week so we can really ask those difficult questions about this uh, because I am concerned about how we should be handling all these situations. 
and um, what's the best approach for you. So again, here I go with the gray news and, and not a lot of clarity. So um, Tammy, is uh, the medical exemption no longer applies to employees, but it still applies to guests in the store, is that correct? That is correct. At this point in time, the, in, the customers coming into your store, that guidance has not changed. That if they state or somehow indicate they have a medical condition, they can still shop in the store. The six foot distancing is highly, highly encouraged and recommended, um, but you do not have to move any farther than that with customers. So I would assume that the same would apply to our vendors that are entering the stores who stock, who work with our uh, store employees for ordering that type of thing, the, the mat, they would be considered under the employee category. Yes, yes. That um, If you look at the new guidance that we've posted, it does clearly state business owners should apply their customer policy to vendors and contractors. So it's saying the customer policy. So they've put it oh. up there with the employee guidance, but it clearly says apply their customer policy. Um, and I know earlier that we had some guidance from L and I and and a letter that you could provide to your vendors to say, you know, they needed to have a mask. But the new guidance that we have says it's customer policy. So again, yeah. a little different than what we were told before, because we were of the understanding they were treated similar to how we treat employees. So we've already had phone calls, Tammy, uh about uh, so those employees that have to uh, leave the workplace because they refuse to wear a mask and we just heard from employment security on what makes them eligible for uh, unemployment insurance uh, are there any benefits available to employees that just refuse or even uh, the, if they have a medical note, what is your direction to the employer on those employees that have to leave the premise? Yeah, so this is, this is where that gray area comes in because when you look at the unemployment statute and you also look at the emergency benefits, both of them clearly say in order to get the unemployment benefit, you have to be medically, uh, physically and mentally able to work. And so in this situation, because it's a mask requirement, you're not physically or mentally able to work. And uh, so that's why we're trying to get a little clarity around here. We are treating this as a medical condition right now, um, but we're trying to figure out at this point, they would be eligible for the emergency sick leave, which is up to 80 hours and it's separate from any paid time off they have. Um, and right now, that's really the only benefit that is clear that they will be eligible for. Um, so yeah, so we really need to get more answers on this. Okay, so uh, uh, more questions every week, more clarity that cause more questions. <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> So uh, uh, let's. Uh, that was the two topics we wanted to cover today. Uh, let's open it up to all of our members. Any questions or any uh, successful things you've tried in your business that would help your fellow members here? Uh, open it up for anything we can do as staff to get the answers for you. Tammy, you said you were going to post something about somebody that had a good idea about a face shield with cloth or something. Yeah, you know, that's what I was just trying to figure out. If there's a way I can share my screen, I could show you there is. the picture. I will okay. give you that option right now. Okay, perfect. Okay, you can show your screen. Okay, okay so you should have a picture of let me see if I minimize this, of a shield where they've just taken a, a piece of cloth 
and they've wrapped it around the front of the bottom part of the shield and uh, and then it tucks in under the sides. I thought that was a really good example because all the ones I found look more like beekeeper <laughs> type masks. So um, yeah, so I thought this was a good uh, concept of what Ellen I has said we could do. Can you email that to the group or something? Or are you going to post it or what are you going to do? You know, I thought I would post it, um, okay. but I'll do a little more reconnaissance on this and then I'll post it on the website. So you have some ideas because really you just need hot glue gun or tape and and you can do this. Timmy, that even okay. looks like Velcro on it too. Yeah, it does. It does look like Velcro. So, and, and I need to talk to Kevin because I don't know where he found this. So I need to get more information, find out where he found it. Um, so we can see if there's any <laughs> anything out there with a little guidance on how we can make it or where we can get some of the materials. Uh, if you Google there, I'm sorry. Kevin's if son, Kevin's son. Okay. Oh, good, Kevin. Where did you there find this? There was a Google image search. Okay. I just looked for, uh, I searched for face shield with fabric uh, outside. Okay. And there's, oh, a bunch of, there's a bunch of different ones, but um, this one looks like what they'd expect, not just some sort of cloth dropping down to your chin. I, I think this will make everybody who doesn't want to wear a mask equally unhappy. So. Exactly. I, I think it's going to really draw out the ones who really need <laughs> to wear a shield. It looks like Jamie also, uh, Jamie, are, is Jamie a muted that she can? Uh... I'm, I'm unmuted now. It's noisy in the background. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. sure can. Go ahead, Jamie. So what we did was we had face shields and employees literally stapled bandanas to the bottom, similar to this picture, but it hung completely down um, to the bottom of the neck, sort of at the clavicle area, and it completely covered chin. I mean, it gave them a little bit more breathing space, and they um, they appreciated that. Could you, uh, Jamie, can you take a photograph of one of those yeah. and... and uh, yep. Uh, send it over to us. Why don't you go ahead and send it to Tammy, T A M M I E at W A blah blah blah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I yeah. will. I'm looking on my phone to see my picture, but I, I, if not, I will take one um, as soon as we get off the call, and I'll send it to Tammy. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks. Yeah. Great. So, Tammy, it looks like we have another question in here about uh, uh, benefits, paid family, medical leave. Rebecca, can you read that? So I think I need to take the controls back because I can no longer see the questions panel. Okay. I'll go right so, ahead. I'm done. It's Laurel and she said, can employees apply for Washington paid family medical leave uh, who are unable to wear masks for a medical reasons? Yeah, so that's where we were doing a lot of our research. Um, and when you look at the guidance for the different types of leave, there's absolutely nothing that covers a medical leave for a required face mask. So that's why we're stumped on this and, and saying we need some clarity around what type of leave, you know, L and I and the governor's office is expecting these workers to take. Because when you look at your regular family leave, it, it does not meet the, the requirement of a, a serious medical condition um, unless they, you know, have something a little more severe that they have documented uh, than maybe. Um, so it's going to be one of those gray areas where they're going to have to to prove a, a serious medical condition in order to get the paid family leave. Now, we also have these emergency family leave benefits that I think it specifically does not cover this issue. It's more about family and, and your you know child not being able to go to daycare and, and things like that. So there's absolutely nothing in these leaves that covers this. And, and we even put up on the website again on new this week was um, the different benefits and, and how they're covered. But 
we just, we can't find anything that really covers the situation. So at the, at the bottom of the screen right now that you're looking at it says WFIA a comparison chart on, on PFML and sick leave. Um, when you go through those, there's absolutely nothing that covers this scenario. Um, so like I say, I'm, I'm looking at it as a medical condition right now. Um, we do have the emergency sick leave and they do get up to 80 hours. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm looking at right now, but, um, but definitely we want clarity and guidance on this to make sure that we all know how we're supposed to be treating these. Could you invite Nick or Sherry on the call next week from the governor's office to yeah. respond to this very specifically? Yeah, I, I, I plan on having the governor's office and labor and industries on this call because they're the ones that are giving us this guidance and supposedly going to prepare the question and answer. So they need to be on the call to answer all the questions that we have on this. So okay. definitely be thinking about this, everyone, and, and be ready with some really good questions because I'm just not finding any good, clear direction for us on this. Or even submit your questions in advance so uh, Tammy can send it over to whoever's going to be on the call and let them noodle on it because it may be issues they haven't thought about. And so we, we may get better guidance from Are them if we Please give go. questions in advance. Mm -hmm. Was that you, Kevin? Yeah. Uh, la last week, I think it was last week, we had an LNI guy, and he said if you couldn't accommodate, as a last, you know, he said we'd want this to be a last resort, but if you just absolutely couldn't accommodate it, it would be a layoff. And as an organized employer, I would much prefer the layoff scenario because I don't have to continue to fund benefits in mm -hmm. the case of family medical leave. I have to fund benefits for, you know, God knows how long versus a layoff. Um, you know, earlier guidance said, you know, that employee had to find a job where they could work by themselves. Um, so if we're steering people around, my vote is keep it away from a medical leave and it's an uh, inability to accommodate. It's going to be, cheaper for guys like me in the long run. Absolutely understand. Okay, I see a question here from Sandy. Rebecca, you wanna ask that question for us? Yeah, it just says, how would you clean it? Talking about those shields that have the cloth stapled or Velcroed. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I think, again, the cloth, uh, like they did with the Velcro makes it a little easier to be able to clean those versus if you glue it, you know, at some point that mask just becomes disposable. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the best approach on that. Okay, so I don't see any other questions. Rebecca, are there any hands up or anything? Uh, not that I see. Okay. Are there any topics or speakers or subject matters that anybody wants us to prepare for next week besides the governor's office and Ellen and I to give clarity to their third or fourth or fifth <laughs> mass guidance and, and benefits if you have to lay that employee off? Oh, Dave Martin had his hand up. Dave, do you have a question? Yeah, I got a quick one. With everything to go in all these places with curbside pickup, do all these businesses now fall under the litter tax rules because they have food and things to go that they previously weren't under the rules? Uh, I'm trying to track you, Dave. You're Our grocery stores are already under the litter tax and so are restaurants. Right. So who is it? I mean, example. Everybody I'm, that has curbside pickup technically falls under it now. And that's a lot of businesses. Where you place your order and then you just stop by and pick it up. Oh, okay. you're talking about just regular retailers now? Like, yep. Regular retailers. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're all under the litter tax anyway. All the hardware stores, stationery stores, all of them are under under the litter tax. 
Okay, because the next big thing I see coming up is all the wipes for carts and maps are just littering parking lots. And sooner or later, somebody's going to start complaining to the state that they need somebody or something or some incentive to cause the grocery stores or whoever to start cleaning up the litter, their cre- extra litter that the COVID-19 has now created with cart wipes and masks, disposable masks, et cetera. Yeah. Yep. That's what the existing uh, litter tax is for. That, uh, yeah. But that that triggers a, a issue. I just got off a federal call a little bit ago, and, you know, the U.S. Senate is back in session working. And um, one of the provisions for the new package that appears to have bipartisan support is a a reimbursement to employers for PPE and structural changes. And they're looking at making it retroactive to January 1. So we'll be working with you all um, as we get a little more clarity on on the federal legislation as it develops to do grassroots. We have a great grassroots system that's electronic that makes it easy for you because the other thing that is in question right now that's very very important is uh, we were told the republicans would absolutely block the additional six hundred dollars a week because they saw what it was doing in terms of inviting people to stay home rather than to return to work but the president was putting pressure on the Republicans. So now that issue is back on the table and we're, we're trying to work with our congressional delegation to say that our, our UI benefits in our state are one of the highest in the nation and you add the 600 on it, there's no reason to come back and some of our facilities are facing labor shortages. So we're going to be very active over the next two weeks. Um, The next two weeks is a critical period for them to get a bill put together and passed. And we are going to need you on the grassroots level. So stay tuned. And Kat is always great to get our grassroots system set up and out to y'all to keep you informed and give you the opportunity to state your position. So that's all we have this week and we appreciate y'all coming in and listening to our mass confusion of the state of Washington. And I hope y'all have a great week and thanks Tammy and um, appreciate y'all. Thank Bye-bye. you all.